Hello, American Prestige listeners. It's Derek. I'm joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Danny Bessner. And we are joined today by uh, James Cavallaro, professor of law, uh, executive director of the University Network for Human Rights, uh, and a man who has just recently had his nomination to serve on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights withdrawn by the Biden administration, presumably, or it seems like, over criticism uh, of Israel's human rights record. James, first of all, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. Uh, so why don't we start with uh, just kind of give people a sense of your own background. This is this would have been, uh, I think, the second time you'd served on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So just give people a, kind of a sense of your background in this field. So thanks for the question. I- I've been working uh, in human rights, really for my entire adult life, which is quite a while now, uh, but starting in the 1980s, uh, during the conflicts and wars in Central America, initially working with Central American refugees. Uh, then I worked for a number of years in Brazil for Human Rights Watch. I opened the office and was the director of the office for Human Rights Watch in Brazil. I founded another organization also in Brazil with colleagues from Brazil to work internationally on human rights. And uh, then I returned to the United States, became a professor at Harvard Law School. I directed the clinic in human rights at Harvard Law School. I did that for almost a decade. And then I lateraled, as it were, to Stanford Law School, set up the human rights clinic there and ran ran that for almost a decade. And uh, now I run an organization called the University Network for Human Rights, which which brings together uh, and promotes the creation of centers to train students in social justice through human rights across disciplines. And we work with a number of universities now. I still teach. I teach at Wesleyan University. I teach at Columbia Law School, at Yale Law School, at UCA Law Law School. And uh, I also uh, teach and work with schools, both in law and in other disciplines in human rights uh, in other parts of the world. But relevant to this discussion, in 2013, the Obama administration nominated me to serve on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, I was elected by the states in the Organization of American States, and I served on the commission from 2000, beginning of 2014 to the end of 2017, a four-year period, including as president in 2016-17. And the last thing I would say just as background to tee this up is the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is a body within the Organization of American States, is the main oversight body that assesses and critiques the practices of human rights in the Western Hemisphere of all states. And the commissioners who are elected by states do not represent their states. They are independent experts, and they are charged with being knowledgeable about human rights and in doing the difficult oversight of human rights in a thorough and independent fashion without ties to government, any government, and without uh, politics affecting their decisions on human rights. So let's just get into it. I mean, what what happened here? The Biden administration approached you to to serve another term uh, on the commission. How did that process play out, and and how you know how long did it take before um, you know they they started surfacing these issues that I guess uh, they had with your public comments? Yeah. So it, it's worth noting that my period on the commission ended in 2017, the end of 2017, in January uh, 1, 2018, I returned to my prior roles as a civil society practitioner and activist and an academic. And so, you know, my, my tweets over the period from 2018 to the present are as Jim Cavallaro. They're not as James Cavallaro commissioner on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And there's an important distinction that I'll get to. So uh, just on the process, the first time that I was, uh, when I was selected as commissioner, I was at, I was invited to apply. So I received the call from state. This time, state sent out a much broader notification to folks generally in the civil society, human rights, academic community. Uh, if you're interested in, in being considered to be a, a commissioner, please uh, let us know. And uh, my colleague actually submitted an application for me and then state got in touch with me and said, no, no, you have to submit the application. You have to ratify this. And I called up folks I knew at state to see is, is this viable? And uh, they said, yeah, we think you'd be a strong candidate. I submitted the application. This is a few months ago. 
And then there were a number of back and forth and discussions. There was an interview. And some of my public statements came up, uh, some of my tweets on issues. And I said, look, here's, here's what I will do uh, if I am elected to the commission. I will only speak on issues in the Americas. And in particular, the commission has a rule. And the rule is really to keep states from putting folks on the commission that will help them. And the rule is that commissioners cannot speak about their own countries. So, I mean, the idea is, you know, if you're Chilean, you don't talk about Chile. You, you can, and not just talk, you can't vote or weigh in or participate in any deliberations that the commission has about human rights in your own country. And that's designed to keep states from putting their folks on the commission to help out their states against accusations of rights abuse. And it's a good rule. And I tell the folks that said, I said, look, I, I respect that rule. I applied it rigorously and I would apply it rigorously. I'll even apply it while I am a commissioner and not tweet anything about the United States or United States foreign policy as though I were a commissioner, even though there's a period where uh, between being nominated, the elections and when one would begin service if elected. And then what happened is all this is, you know, it's happened at breakneck speed. So on Friday, the State Department uh, publicly announced my candidacy. Uh, for for the weekend, I, you know, my it was quite nice actually. My inbox was flooded and and uh, emails and WhatsApp messages and calls and texts. This is great, Jim. Congratulations, people I know in Latin America, people who thought I did a, 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 a solid job the first time I was a commissioner. Human rights victims, human rights organizations. This is great. I hope you win. How can we support you? That was what I spent the weekend doing, just thanking people. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it, uh, et cetera. And then Monday morning, I got an email from a journalist at the Alga Miner, a fringe source. I was not aware of it until I got an email asking me, these, did you tweet uh, this support of the characterization of Israeli government policy in, 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 in the territory and in Israel as apartheid? Did you criticize Hakeem Jeffries because of his receipt of hundreds of thousands of dollars of campaign contributions from APAC, et cetera, et cetera? And I, 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 I forwarded that, the email to the folks at state, say, Hey, heads up, you know, this is coming down the pike. And, uh, they had already received it within 24 hours. This is Monday morning. By Tuesday morning, someone at state contacts me to say the ambassador, you know, would like to speak to you, but you know, this has caused a lot of consternation and, and the ambassador is, is likely to tell you that they're going to pull your nomination, but he, he has to speak with you. I said, okay, I'll speak with the ambassador. Speak with the ambassador. And, uh, basically the, 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 the readout of that conversation was that my positions on, my position on what is happening in Palestine today, and that is that the practices of the Israeli government, the discriminatory treatment of Palestinians, the first class and second class citizenship, the range of rights abuses, that it, it rises to the level of apartheid. That's the main concern for, for State Department because that's diametrically opposed to their view. Now, it just so happens that the characterization of the situation in Israel-Palestine as apartheid is the view of Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, B'Tselem, Al-Haq, the Harvard Human Rights Program. I could go on. It's pretty much the view of all informed observers. So what it sounds like to me is that the State Department is particularly concerned about the use of the word apartheid. Uh, that you, my guess is that if you had criticized Israel, as, as many, 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 many people do for their treatment of Palestinians in the occupied territories, um, it, you might have been able to slide, but it was the use of the term apartheid that really got them. Do you think that's accurate? And if so, why is that such a, a, a term that, that basically they, they would remove your nomination? Yes, I agree that that is accurate for two reasons. First, it is pretty much accepted across the board that every state on the planet commits human rights violations at some level through action or omission. Pick a state. Norway, the United States, Ireland, no state is perfect. Violations occur. So to say that there are violations in country X or Y or Z is not particularly problematic. The issue is apartheid because apartheid is an entirely different level of violation. 
it is an extremely severe and grave violation of international law. And it is one that while Palestinian organizations and Israeli organizations have recognized has been occurring in Israel and Palestine for some time, it's one because it is so charged, it has taken a very long time for Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International to recognize what folks in the area, Israeli organizations and Palestinian organizations, have realized previously. Why is it so severe? Because it's not about, oh, this, this police officer or this soldier acted in a violent and irresponsible fashion. Uh, it, it's, it's a bad apple. We investigate that person and, and we prosecute them and, and, and we try and continue to respect rights, right? That's the sort of best case scenario state response. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a state policy that is designed to repress a, a, a people or an ethnic group and to prioritize another ethnic group. Uh, so it, and it's, you know, again, the, the classic example, and I'm not going to say this is what's happening in Israel, Palestine is better or worse or different. But the classic example, when you use the term apartheid for most people is South Africa. And it just conjures up really ugly, horrible images. Politically, it has a really strong valence. I think that's why the State Department is so keen on avoiding it. Unfortunately, it happens to be the case in terms of a measured, careful, critical analysis of the facts of I Israeli governmental policy, the facts of the repression and the subordination and the lack of citizenship rights that Palestinians face. It happens to be an accurate characterization of the law. But it also is one that is highly problematic for the United States in terms of its foreign policy and its near absolute support for the Israeli government, no matter what it does, no matter how many settlements it increases, no matter how it excludes uh, Palestinians from full citizenship, no matter uh, how much it limits the rights in, of Palestinian, Palestinians in the occupied territory, no matter how much uh, it subjects Palestinians to military jurisdiction, uh, to a state of occupation, uh, no, ma no matter what the situation is in Gaza, which is in effect an open air prison from which uh, uh, departure is virtually impossible, where there's uh, limited access to electricity, water, et cetera, et cetera. The conditions don't matter. The United States has a policy and unfortunately works backwards from that. We're going to support Israel. What do we need to do? Oh, we need to throw Cavallaro under the bus. We need to make this a litmus test for uh, being an independent expert on the Inter-American Commission. Unfortunately, it seems that the State Department has accepted that cost in why? I mean, uh, why? So, like, yeah. what is it? What is the U.S. super interest in Israel? I mean, like, I clearly, I, I, I understand what the U.S. interest in Israel is, but it does seem to occupy a particularly important place in the State Department's imagination. So, what is driving that um, to the degree where there? I mean, it's, it's not even that relevant. Like, your job would not have been especially relevant to this. But what's driving this hypersensitivity? To criticism of Israel. Yeah, excellent point. Look, it, it, it's not that there's a close relation or, or a distant relation between U.S. foreign policy regarding Israel-Palestine and the position that it would have held. There's zero relation. None, none, none whatsoever. The Inter-American Commission has no remit over Israel and Palestine. And even more so, as a U.S. national on the commission, I would be recused from any matter that in any way involve the United States. So yeah, zero impact on the inter-American system, except unfortunately a really, really toxic impact, which is to now unofficially make service as a purported independent expert on the inter-American commission as a U.S. national to include a litmus test of a particular position on Israel. So the only, that's the only impact. There's, there's no impact that I would have had on U.S.-Israel relationship or on Palestine. So why are they so concerned? And again, here, you know, I'm, I'm speculating. Part of it is there's the geopolitical interests that the United States has. It sees Israel as an ally in the Middle East. Uh, there's a very strong security relationship. There's billions of dollars, blah, blah, billions of dollars of military aid and other aid that, that we as taxpayers 
send to uh, the Israeli government on an annual basis. And again, pretty much regardless of what their policies are, and they change and they get worse and they've gotten worse where they might get better. The aid still continues to flow. So there's that. And then another part of this is, and I think this is not just state, and I don't know at what level this decision was made. Uh, I, I can't say. I, I, I strongly suspect it was made above the level of the folks with whom I was interfacing. But there's also the, the very political issue of one of the tweets that, uh, ex- that, that caused concern was my criticism of the significant financial contributions by APAC, which is a political action committee that uh, supports and advances the interests of Israel in the United States. They, they made significant and continue to make significant political contributions to Hakeem Jeffries. I am very concerned about the role of money in U.S. politics. I think Citizens United was a terrible decision. I think we need campaign uh, finance reform, uh, etc. But in practice, why is state as concerned as it is about criticism of Israel? If you just count the number of folks in Congress who receive significant support from APAC, and think of how many folks in in Congress, how many folks in the uh, majority in the Senate or the near majority of the Democrats, you know, in Congress, they're close, right? They had a majority. How many of those folks receive significant contributions from APAC? How many of them would be primaried if they stepped out of line on, on Israel issues? That's, that's part of what's going on also. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm allowed to say this. Uh, I, I find it very offensive when anti-Semitism is weaponized in that regard, you know, cause I, we're on the left, you know, it's just flat out, Derek and I, and you would say something like Joe Manchin is bought by fossil fuel companies. And, and I, I don't quite understand why it would be considered a trope to use a similar, um, not even language, but to express the fact that there's a similar, a similar transactionality when APAC gives money to Congress members. This is, this is what lobbying groups do. And I just find it very offensive as a Jew that this anti-Semitism discourse is weaponized in this way um, when it's just exposing a basic feature of international politics. And as we talked about on this podcast, as, as listeners know, it's not just APAC, it's also Christian Zionist organizations and other groups that that, that give a lot of money for quote-unquote pro-Israel or pro, I should add, according to who. Uh, you know, when Israel speaks in the name of international Jewry, uh, I don't think it's basically speaking in my name. So whatever, we could get into that. But why do you think how do you, how do you think this, this sort of weaponized anti-Semitism was used in this case? And and, and do you have any thoughts about that? I, I have, uh, and, and again, thank you for saying what you said, it, it, because I really touched uh, a raw nerve. The weaponization of anti-Semitism is, is terribly unfortunate for several reasons. First, as you might imagine, as a human rights activist, I am deeply concerned about anti-Semitism. Semitism. I'm concerned about any kind of hate speech. Uh, I call out hate speech. I call out hateful acts. I call out hateful policies and rights abuses wherever they occur. That's part of what makes it so problematic when people with a p- political agenda try to weaponize the term anti-Semitism in, in areas where it just does not apply and where what it does is it smears a person who's acting in good faith. When you say Joe Manchin is bought by the uh, coal or, or the fossil fuel industry, you, you, you get a pass on that because kind of everyone knows it's true. If you say Hakeem Jeffries is, is, is bought by the pro-Israeli government lobby, now you've somehow invoked an anti-Semitic trope. And that's what's happened with me. It wasn't even a tweet. It was a reply to a tweet where that's basically what I said. And now that, that is being leveraged to say that I'm an anti-Semite. And look at it, it's, 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 I will say, it is effective. It's effective. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's wrongful. And I suspect that pretty much everyone who uses anti-Semitism and that sort of taking of alleged tropes, I think they kind of know what they're doing. 
And, and I don't absolutely, think absolutely they know what yeah. they're doing. Absolutely, they're they, they're this is the this is the thing because what happens is when there is genuine anti-Semitism, it makes it harder to to truly identify when you when you identify every criticism of Israel or sort of like if if you if you squint from the right mirror angle, you could identify a trope that was popular seventy years ago about how Jews interact in the world. It actually, I think. Um, weakens the battle against genuine anti-Semitism, of which there is still some, of course, obviously. Uh, people people know that. And so, again, just as a Jew, I find that very offensive. Yeah. As, and, as, as someone who is not Jewish... Uh, Nobody's also, perfect! <laughs> as someone who's not Jewish, I, I find it hurtful. It's hurtful to, to be accused of being anti-Semitic or having employed an anti-Semitic trope I, I just find it hurtful, and it's and, and it's quite intentionally so, and it also seeks to smear and delegitimate and change the conversation, all of those things. But it is unfortunately common, and unfortunately still effective. And I think we need to to push back on that, and we need to ch- we need to challenge that idea. Anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is real. It's ugly. We need to combat it. I don't think anyone is helped by combating. What is not anti-Semitism, framing it as anti-Semitism, and smearing people uh, who actually are, are allies in the fight against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and any anti-LGBTQ hatred. Like, why? Why, if you're really concerned about anti-Semitism, would you want to lose allies by smearing folks who aren't anti-Semitic because they have different positions on Israel? But again, yeah, it's, um, it's almost like question. it's a political agenda. <laughs> so. James, to bring it back to the the Biden administration, uh, I mean, I, I've read a few, a bit of the coverage about this now, and my sense is that uh, the administration's justification for pulling your nomination was they were somehow blindsided by these comments that you had made. What you've described in the process, uh, like going through with them and looking at past social media posts and deleting many of them would seem to suggest that that's not a fair assessment of, of how this has gone, that they were sort of, uh, they had no idea you had said these things. They were blindsided by it. I'm curious your take on that and, and what it says, whether this is uh, about whether this is really a principled objection or it's uh, uh, they're, they're in fear of bad news coverage, basically. Again, tough for me to uh, to know their subjective mind frame. I, I can say that in the past and during the process, there were some concerns expressed by some folks about my tweets, which I presume to mean some of the positions that I have or I've had in the five years since I was a commissioner. Uh, again, I think part of what's going on and this is unfortunate, and this is one of the takeaways from this whole episode that, that is that is most problematic. I think the folks in what's called USOAS, which is the U.S. mission or ambassadorship or embassy to the Organization of American States, right? So this Organization of American States, think of it like the UN. Every state in the Western Hemisphere has an embassy to the OAS. The United States has an embassy to the OAS, except since the United States is in the United States, uh, it just has what's called, uh, it's called USOIS and it's part of State Department. All right. So that's the team at the State Department that decides on who's going to be the candidate. I don't think they are as concerned about my position on Israel and Palestine because it just is not in their bailiwick. I, I think this is something that they thought it doesn't really matter. It's probably not going to be public. When it became public, I'm not even sure. I don't know how much of an issue it was for folks in US OAS. I think it's an issue for folks at higher and other levels of state and maybe other parts of the US government. So I think that's part of what's going on that there was a sense, okay, moving forward, I'm not going to tweet about this. Uh, and I might even, you know, go, go back and, and deactivate my account so that I have a clean, fresh start. Here's who I am as a candidate. I think they thought this is probably not going to get out. And it doesn't really matter that much. Once somebody picked it up, then the hand wringing, so to speak, uh, began, and not just in what's called USOIS, the mission to the Organization of American States, but uh, higher up in, at state and higher up beyond state. 
Sure, sure. I, I think, um, you know, sort of a maybe final question. This is an administration, the Biden administration, that promised very early on to center human rights in American foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, it seems to me that they've continued the same typical practice of U.S. foreign policy of uh, kind of human rights for thee, but not human rights for, for us or not human rights for uh, any of our friends. We don't turn that lens on countries that uh, agree with us. I'm curious, uh, you know, if uh, having come through this process now and, and had this uh, outcome, what you make now of the Biden administration's commitment to human rights as a core facet of, of U.S. foreign policy? Well, well look, at I'll, I'll tell you, first off, I, I agree with the fundamental premise that you're putting forward is that unfortunately, not just this administration, but going back decades, really, to, to the Second World War, when human rights have clashed with what the administration at any given time believes to be its foreign policy interest during the Cold War or their allies they're in the fight against communism, even though they're massacring uh, hundreds or thousands of people, uh, whether it's Indonesia in 1965 or uh, El Salvador in the, in, the, in the late 1970s, unfortunately, historically, the United States government has chosen its perceived strategic interests over human rights. Has this government been significantly different? You know, maybe, yeah, it's been better than the last administration, but ultimately when push comes to shove, when it sees its core strategic interests internationally and also domestically, politically, in terms of you know, who's elected, who's not elected, when it sees those as threatened, then unfortunately, human rights takes a backseat, which is exactly what happened to me. Because to be crystal clear, in my case, what I think about apartheid in Israel has absolutely no bearing on my ability to be a commissioner. But it had, might have some cost, so to speak, for the Biden administration. And that's it. The Inter-American Commission loses a potentially independent, critical voice. Uh, that's a cost that they're willing to pay. It's a human rights cost. It's a really bad cost in Latin America. It, it, it's not a good look. And it will also, unfortunately, create an incentive for other states in Latin America to put folks much closer to their governments that pass their government's litmus tests on the commission rather than independent experts. But it's a cost they're willing to accept, so to speak, to promote whatever their perceived geopolitical interest is. So does it ring hollow? Yeah, it rings hollow when Biden says, we're going to put human rights at the center. If human rights were at the center here, this would not be an easy choice. I would still be the nominee. This would not be a hard choice. This would not be a hard choice. Not be a hard choice. I'm yes. sorry, it would not be a hard choice. It would be an easy <laughs> choice. Uh, on that note, uh, James Cavallaro, thank you so much for coming on the program. Uh, sorry that this happened to you, and I think it is a real travesty. Uh, and hopefully uh, there will be some critical uh, eye turned toward the Biden administration over this because I think it's well-deserved. But thank you again for, for doing this. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.